I uh, was once the spokesperson of the foreign ministry, and I traveled with the foreign minister to China, to Beijing, to open up, to open a new embassy in uh, Beijing. That was in 1992. And I gave an interview to a Chinese uh, uh, newspaper, actually the uh, news agency, Xinhua, and I, I got the impression that the reporter who spoke to me did not really understand what we are talking about. So I asked her, uh, do you know what the size of Israel is? And she said, well, you're a very tiny little nation. I said, yes, but how tiny? She said, oh, very tiny. 40 or 50 million people, not more than that. At the time, we were about four and a half million. So it's a question of dimensions. China, of course, is the largest population on Earth. But Israel is uh, being mentioned in the media as if it was at least as large as China. And it is not. We are a tiny little country. Denmark, this wonderful kingdom, is uh, 55,000 uh, square kilometers. Israel, uh, with the West Bank and Gaza and all that, which is not part of Israel, is 28,000. Without these territories, Israel is less than 21,000 square kilometers. Yet the population of Israel, without the territories, is about um, 8 million. Whereas the population of Denmark is uh, 5 million and a half. So we are a very condensed country, but there's room. Back in 1930, when the British were in control of the country, they introduced a report, an economic report, of the economic capacity of the country. And they came to the conclusion that the country cannot hold more than one million people altogether, Jews and Arabs to, uh, together. This is that was the beginning of the curtailing of Jewish immigration to the country uh, because there's not enough room. Well, right now between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, there are 10 million Jews and Arabs, and I think that we can still have additional five or so. Doesn't matter now when we are such a um, high-tech, advanced country. For many years, people used to say that uh, the next war, so to speak, in the Middle East will be on water. And indeed, uh, the area in which we live, the Middle East, is very arid. It does not have a lot of rain. Though today, thank God, today we have such a big, big, big rain in Israel that uh, there are floodings in the, in the streets. There's so much and everyone is happy because of that. Um, but we have developed a system of desalination uh, according to which we, um, as a result of which, we produce now about 80% of all household consumption of water we drink from the sea. Uh, we, we use desalinated water. And uh, if you go over Israel, you will see the uh, lilac-colored or lilac-painted uh, pipes. These are uh, recycled water from sewage, yeah, that we use for, uh, for industry and for uh, even, in some cases, uh, agriculture. So there's enough water. It's just a question of price. Yes, it takes a lot of investment, but it takes also a lot of innovation. And we have that spirit of uh, innovation. And we are willing to use our knowledge and to use our innovation to promote peace. To give you one example in that respect, in the peace agreement that we signed with Jordan in 1994, Jordan is a country on our east, even more arid and drier than we are, we agreed to give them each year 400 million cubic meters of water. We took it from the Sea of Galilee. 
because we don't have any other source of clean water. Now we do. It's called the Mediterranean Sea. And when we reach the agreement with the Palestinians, God willing, we will be able to replenish the water reservoirs together with them and to give them water for their agriculture if we have an, an agreement. Then they used to say that the next war in the Middle East will be on energy because of the depleting uh, uh, sources of energy. Lo and behold, we found out uh, that on the uh, shelf outside, out of our country, on the Mediterranean uh, Sea, there, are, there is enough gas to feed us for 175 years or 200 years or something like that. So we began to drill. We're doing it together with Cyprus. We have uh, uh, delineated where the economic line goes between Israel and Cyprus. We live for the Lebanese on the uh, north uh, east of uh, that area. What we believe is theirs, and they're welcome to join us in the agreement. So it will be not just a uh, bilateral agreement between uh, Israel and Cyprus, but a trilateral agreement between Israel, Lebanon, and Cyprus. The moment they choose to abandon their hostility and come into agreement with us, they are willing, they will come to uh, share it. So we have enough energy, don't we? And besides, we are the first country in the world to utilize the sun. Israel is a very sunny country, and those of you who have visited Israel must have seen the solar systems all over Israel. Every flat, every house, every building in Israel must, by law, have a solar system. And we have hot water 24-7 just from the sun. Of course, in the winter, we have to turn on our boilers, but that's only in the winter, and the winter is a very short uh, uh, season uh, uh, in Israel, unfortunately. So we are a country that uh, has grown out of a lot of misery, a lot of suffering, a lot of endurance, but we are now a grown-up country. We are members of the OECD, we have an advanced economy, we have a high-tech society, we have a very good literature, theater, music, you name it. It's a very good country. So why is it so much in the press and why is it in the media uh, in such a um, critical uh, description all the time? I'm not sure I have a full answer, but let me share with you one uh, thought. The country is very small. There's always something going on. Maybe a new invention, maybe a new addition, and maybe some political development or military conflict. But in that, we are not alone. A country is also very comfortable. It attracts many, many foreign journalists. There are at any given time about at least 1,000 foreign correspondents or media personalities, media people in Israel. This is more <coughs> than the number that you have in places like Washington or Moscow, and that is in the tiny country of Israel. Naturally, everything will be covered, and naturally, there will be stories. Not only that, Israel is a very comfortable country to live in. From the point of view of a foreign journalist who would like to uh, cover an interesting story, there's no, more, there's no story that is more interesting than the story of Israel. Now, there are other interesting stories, but over there, in the other stories, one has to, excuse my terminology, to eat a lot of dust in order to, to cover uh, the, the uh, story that he or she wants uh, to cover. And I'm full of admiration when I see these uh, journalists who go into uh, interesting area, areas and to danger zones wearing the arms and so on and so forth to bring us in the West the story. Well, in Israel, one can live 
in a modern city, let's say Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, where you have uh, ATM in every street corner, money machine, and uh, so many uh, orchestras, and the best restaurants, uh, believe me, and, uh, and uh, all the services, very good education, and one gets into one's car, and in 15 minutes, one is in the middle of a very interesting story. And then one gets back home and writes the story in the comfort of his air-conditioned uh, flat, and, uh, you know, life is good. And the story is interesting. So Israel attracts a lot of attention in that respect. Now, I know that this is just a partial explanation. I will not diminish the importance of the conflict in which uh, we live. Now, the conflict. Everyone thinks about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Well, it is an important conflict, but this is not the only aspect of our defense and security and diplomatic uh, difficulties. Uh, constantly we are reminded that we, are, we have the upper hand in the uh, conflict between us and the Palestinians. I had an argument a few months ago during the campaign in Gaza with a, with a Danish member of parliament who said to me that um, the moral arrow points at Israel because Israel has no losses and the Palestinians have many losses. And I said, what does this mean? Are you going to uh, judge, us, judge us by numbers? Do we have to have a thousand casualties to acquire your sympathy? Then I prefer not to have your sympathy. There is a reason why there were so many casualties on the other side and so few in Israel. In Israel, we invest a lot of money in the protection of the population. Every new flat since 1991, because we were attacked by missiles and rockets from Iraq, in a war that we had nothing to do with. It was the US and the UK and other countries that invaded Iraq, but Saddam decided to inflict his uh, uh, fervor on Israel in order to attract us and to get us into the war. We did not. We stayed calm, but we took 40 missiles and people got killed. And so ever since then, by law, every new flat must have not only a shelter, but also a secured room. Secured room means that it's in your flat, you can use it for, your, for whatever you want. Study, you know, kids' uh, playground or whatever. A small room with, uh, that is built of concrete, and it's one on top of the other, so it's like a tower of concrete which is fortified and strong, and it's uh, blocked with uh, metal, actually steel doors, steel window with rubber uh, to uh, block any gas or any biological agents that could be dropped by missiles or from the air, and everyone is protected, therefore. Uh, the uh, attacks that we've uh, been exposed to from Gaza in the last uh, nine years normally gave our people in the south 15 seconds, 15 seconds to run for shelter. But in most cases, they have these shelters within, uh, within 15 seconds. If they are at home, they can simply run to the secure room. If they are in the streets, well, there are all these uh, defended or protected areas that they can run to. Now, a direct hit is a direct hit, and not much can be done against it. But if it's not directed, you will be protected. Now, they don't do that. They invest the money that they got, and they got tons of money from uh, the European Union and from other organizations. They invest in tunnels, at at attack tunnels, and in uh, building missiles and rockets. Then, you know, 
since the, we were attacked uh, for many years with uh, stabbing and with uh, suicide bombers in the streets, we built a defensive barrier, which some people call a wall. Well, in some cases it is a wall, but mostly it is not. The wall is not nice. The fence is not beautiful, but it stops the terrorists. When it stopped the terrorists and Israel stopped bleeding during the second intifada uh, from 2000 to 2002, uh, we lost 1,200 lives, civilian lives, by suicide bombing and by simple stabbing in the streets uh, by Palestinian terrorists. Then they came with the upper trajectory system that is missiles and rockets that will overcome the fence. So we had to develop a system against this and hence the, the establishment or the creation of the system known as Iron Dome. Iron Dome is a very smart, high-tech defense system. It's a defensive weapon. It's a weapon, it's a weapon that allows Israel to postpone as much as possible the need to go in to the area from which we are attacked because we can absorb some of the uh, missiles. In fact, what it does is that uh, its radar is so sophisticated that it, uh, uh, it can uh, uh, calculate where exactly the missile or the rocket will land. If it lands in a populated area, it will shoot it and it will fire on it and it will destroy it. If it falls in the field, it will let it fall in the field. So we have the level of success of Iron Dome is about 90%, 90%. Which means, by the way, that in the last conflict where uh, Israel was uh, shelled and bombed with 4,500 missiles and rockets, uh, about 4,000 were stopped, which means that about four to 500 did go in, and we did have some casualties. But then, of course, the system of shelters that we have helps us, and not if not many were killed. So I said, well, if our neighbors, first of all, were refraining from using arms against us, there will be no need for all this investment. But if they do, well, if they don't invest in their own protection, we have to respond when we are attacked. So I was told, yeah, but how come that they have so many casualties? I said, because they use the population as human shields. I know it sounds like a cliche now, but it is the truth. The fact that it's being said so many times does not mean that it's not true. This is the fact of life. Even the UN, when they uh, admonish us for uh, bombing uh, schools, UNRWA schools, and UN facilities, admit that, that uh, in many cases these facilities were used to fire rockets on Israel. And uh, I was asked, where do you want them to hide your weapons? At the, at the missiles. I said, what do they have to have missiles for? They don't have to have any missiles. It's against all the agreements that we have signed. If Gaza is part of the future state of Palestine, as it should be, then all the agreements that we have signed with the Palestinian Authority apply to Gaza. And the agreements, especially the Paris Agreement of 1995, say very clearly that the Palestinian Authority and the future Palestinian state can have no army, they can have strong police force, they can have water cannons, they can have machine guns, they can have light weapons to protect themselves, they can have helicopters to control the, you know, what's going on, but they should not have an air force or an army or artillery and certainly no missiles. So why should Gaza have missiles and the West Bank should not? By the way, this is exactly what Hamas is asking. But what they mean is that they want to fill the West Bank also with missiles to attack Israel, which makes us very, very 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, concerned. The conflict in Gaza, in a way, was unavoidable because we can protect ourselves through the Iron Dome system and because of the sheltering system that we have. We could wait. We could be patient. We could allow the international interlocutors to try and try and try once again to talk sense into the heads of Hamas. At some point, when the barrage of missiles and rockets was too much, we had to neutralize the sources of the threat. In July of this year, uh, Hamas started an overall campaign, an attack on Israel. There are many reasons for that. Uh, we believe, at least I believe, uh, that the reason was that they were invited to join the Palestinian government of national unity. And whereas everybody, including our friends in Europe, promised us that that will moderate Hamas because they will want to be part of the government, we said no, on the, absolutely the opposite, because we know them, we're neighbors. That will mean that they will have to show that they're not taking orders from Mahmoud Abbas from the president of the Palestinian Authority, and that they maintain what they call their uh, independence of activity. And lo and behold, they joined the uh, government of national unity in uh, April. By July, we had the horrible case of uh, three Israeli teenagers being kidnapped and murdered. Uh, it was blood chilling to listen to the last call when they called the police and said we've been hijacked. And then the killers realized that they were speaking on the phone and killed them on the spot. And we could see the glee, we, we could hear the gleeful um, chanting of the killers saying to one another, bracing and blessing one another for getting three. Uh, then, a few days later, something that is not less horrible happened. Some Jewish extremists kidnapped an Arab kid just because he was an Arab and killed him in a brutal way, uh, for which I don't know what to say. It's something that should not have happened in our society. The difference is that no, everyone in the Palestinian side unfortunately praised the kidnappers and uh, who were later caught by the IDF and were killed and now they are shahids, martyrs. Whereas in Israel when we found out the alleged killers, they are waiting for their trial. And if I know my country well, they will pay very dearly for what they did because Israel is a country of law and order and there are courts in Jerusalem and they will pay for the crime that they did. Be it as it may, this started, the first, the kidnapping of the three Israeli kids, uh, teenagers, uh, started the uh, campaign from Gaza, and before we knew it, we had hundreds of missiles and rockets on Israel, tens of them every day, and we knew that we were in a conflict. Now, when this war was over, Hamas was depleted by 80% of its capabilities, but they still have about 20%. We believe that we have captured, that we have discovered all the attack tunnels, but we don't know. Unless we dig the whole area, then we don't know if we, if we found every attack uh, a tunnel uh, or not. And these tunnels are very dangerous. I was, two weeks ago, I was in uh, Israel <coughs> with um, Foreign Minister Martin Lidego, and we saw, uh, we're in a small village outside of Gaza that was attacked, and they wanted to show him an attack tunnel, which they have discovered, in the middle of the kibbutz. So it will, you know, come where all the mothers and babies and so on are. 
Unfortunately, we couldn't because at the time there was a lot of rain also and the tunnel was flooded. But uh, he knew what it was all about because a couple of weeks before that, we showed the same tunnel to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, who was very much impressed with uh, daring uh, audacity, if you like, of uh, Hamas. So now we are in a situation where there's no uh, peace negotiations, no peace talks between us and the Palestinians. We would like to resume this uh, way of talking to the Palestinians. We believe that the only way in which we can resolve the conflict is by talking uh, to one another uh, directly. Uh, we had speak, um, we were speaking to the Palestinians since the days of the Oslo Agreement in 1993, and on and off, off and on, it went on, and during these times, we have made quite a few concessions. For example, we have given uh, the Palestinians control over all of the Palestinian cities, which means all the big cities in the, what is known as the West Bank, which means that 95% of the Palestinian population is no longer under any kind of Israeli supervision or any kind of Israeli rule. They're under Palestinian control. We have evacuated unilaterally the Gaza Strip, dismantling some 10 settlements, taking out all the military that we had there, hoping and believing that this will be the launching pad for the new Palestinian state that we could talk to and make an agreement with, but as I've just told you, it did not. What it did become, instead of a launching pad for peace, it became the launching pad of some 17,000 missiles and rockets in the last nine years. In the last summer alone, 4,500. So here we are disappointed, and many of us say that uh, uh, we cannot trust the other side for keeping the peace. Uh, we also reached economic agreements with them. Uh, we collect the taxes for them, for uh, you know, customs and duties that uh, are due to the Palestinian government when they uh, bring uh, merchandise through Israeli territory. We provide them with electricity. We provide them with water. It was quite ironic, you know, in order to create the homemade rockets and missiles, they need to have electricity in Gaza. And the electricity comes from Israel. Okay, so we were giving them, but of course, if we stop it, then we stop also the electricity to hospitals, which we don't want to do. So it's a dilemma that we don't really know how to, uh, how to solve. A water, they need to drink, they need to bathe. They don't have enough water, so we provide them with water. Right now, the Palestinian Authority owes the Israeli uh, electricity company about 1.7 billion shekel, which is like, uh, I believe, 2.6 billion a kroner, that they simply don't pay. And what are we to do? To stop the electricity? Well, I don't know. We don't have an answer for that but uh, at least we know the questions, even if we don't know the answers. Um, there was a lot of advancement, but not enough for them. They want to have a state, and we agree that they will have a state. In fact, since the beginning of our conflict in the 1920s, we always agreed to the two-state solution. When uh, the British came up with a Peel Commission report in 1937, they proposed partitioning of the country, 80% to the Palestinians, 20% to the Jews. We accepted it. They did not. And they started a uh, riot, which was called the Great Arab Rebellion, in the end of which the Mufti of Jerusalem uh, had to flee the country, went to Iraq, started a 
series of pogroms against the Jews. 250 Jews were killed in Baghdad. Then the British chased him out of Iraq, and he went to Germany, and he became an ally of Adolf Hitler. There are pictures of him with the Führer, you know. Uh, in 1947, when the UN proposed the petitioning plan, it was supposed to be 50-50. We accepted, they rejected, they started a war, and they lost it. And now we are offering them, uh, we say that they could have their state, and uh, we always did, as I said, and it's time for us to negotiate of uh, the parameters of this country, of this state. And they say, no, first we'll have the state, then we will talk to him. We say, no, first of all, we'll decide on the parameters, like demilitarization. It's important. We cannot allow a foreign army west of the Jordan River. Those of you who visited Israel recently and may have seen uh, Jordan River, now it's okay, but there were times in which it was very dry. And one of our uh, ministers at the time, the late Igal Alon, said, well, unfortunately, because of, the, uh, of our using of the water, the Jordan River is not much of a river anymore, but it is still a very good anti-tank ditch. So we won't allow any foreign army west of the Jordan River. Now, we have to agree on that before there is a state, because otherwise, what leverage do we have in the negotiations. Uh, do we agree or do we not agree or a unified uh, customs envelope? Do they want to go their own way? They could, but it's not so good for them. They'd rather be part of an advanced economy. Israel is an advanced economy. Our GDP per capita is $34,000 per person every year. Uh, theirs is about uh, 3000 so they can be part of our economy, and, and we're willing to do that because, you know, being an advanced economy, we bring workers from all over the world, from China, from Thailand, from uh, Burma, from... But there could be workers from Palestine. There used to be, and they can come in the morning and go back in the evening like they did. It's a small, tiny, little country, so we can do that. All these things must be addressed before the state of Palestine um, emerges. They, I'm afraid, in the last year or so, have abandoned the idea of negotiations with Israel. What they want is to negotiate with the international community, not with Israel. When they speak to countries that recognize them, like Sweden, they don't have to make any concessions to Sweden. If they talk to us, they have to make concessions to us, like we have to make concessions to them. It's called negotiations, okay? They don't have to negotiate with the EU. They have to negotiate with us. They don't have to negotiate with the United Nations. They have to negotiate with us. If they go to the United Nations <coughs> and ask to join I don't know which organization, let's say the, the uh, uh, International Agreements of Trades and Tariffs, okay, just an organization. They can join it, they will be admitted, but they don't have anything to back it with because they do not have a state. So this is to me a bit ridiculous. If they want to have a state, they, can, they must negotiate with the only side, the only party that can accommodate them a state. But they want to get the state descending from heaven, I don't know, in a gift trap. Maybe it's Christmas soon, so they, can, uh, they, they want to get it as a present. It won't happen like that. It will not happen like that. The only way in which there will be a Palestinian state is by negotiating with us. Now, these negotiations are not going to be easy. We are tough bargainers. And we will fight for what is important for us, like the security of Israel. They will raise the question of settlements. We understand that this is something that they will raise. Fine, it's their right. We also have a few things that we want to raise, such as security, which is very important for us. 
or the uh, finality, that is that whatever agreement we sign, this is it. We don't want to hear anything about a new territory that we have to give up 10 years down the road or something like that. What we sign, we sign, and this is it. Or their acceptance of Israel as a Jewish state, which they refuse to do. And they say that they will never agree to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And uh, this is quite uh, disturbing because we are a Jewish state. We don't need them to tell us who we are. But on the other hand, we do need them to recognize who we are. So it's a touch and go situation right now. But as I said early on, this is not the only problem that we have geopolitically. We are surrounded by an area that is not really quiet. Uh, we have the inner circle of us and the Palestinians where yes, we are the upper hand, we are uh, the more powerful, but around us there are about a quarter billion Arabs and Muslims who do not like us very much. And they are still committed to destroy uh, Israel. And we have to take that into consideration. Then beyond the horizon, we have Iran. Iran, which is working very, very uh, hardly to obtain nuclear military capability. And we will not allow that to happen. But this is what they want. And we know the Iranians. We have a lot of appreciation for them. And they, they can, if they say that they want to have something, they will work to get it. And I'm not sure that we can always uh, uh, rely on the international uh, organizations and the national system to uh, defend our uh, country, to defend our uh, people. This year we will commemorate and celebrate the 70th anniversary of the uh, victory over Nazi Germany. But before that victory, there was the Holocaust in which we lost one third of our nation. One third. For us, the Jews, the story is very simple. In 1939, there were about 20 million Jews in the world, a little less, out of some two billion people, or a little less. And today there are about 14 million Jews, one for 14 million Jews, out of some seven billion. And that's the story. And that's the whole story. And there is no other story. So for us, this generation, the burden of Jewish history is on our shoulders. The burden of the continuation of the Jewish people is upon us. And the responsibility is enormous. So we want to reach peace with our Palestinian neighbors. We do not want to control the Palestinians. No way whatsoever. It's not good for them. It's certainly not good for us. We are not a conquering nation. We've never had an empire. We don't want to have an empire. Uh, but we cannot take chances and risks with no end. I hope and I believe that the Palestinians will come forward. At some point they will realize that even if they have the majority in the United Nations and that they have some kinds of uh, you know, leverage, uh, in the end of the day they will have to talk to us, not to the EU. When the Foreign Affairs Council of the EU convenes tomorrow in Brussels, thinking about new ways to pressurize Israel, I think what will happen if they adopt it is that they will become less relevant to the conflict because we will know that, that we, we, we cannot trust their even-handedness. There is no even-handedness here. The pressure is on Israel because Israel can be pressurized, because Israel has a vast economy and the Palestinians do not. 
I did not hear that the Foreign Affairs Council tomorrow is going to talk about the incitement in the Palestinian society and what is written in Palestinian uh, books, uh, you know, uh, about Israel and about the Jews. They don't tackle that, they tackle only us because we are a democracy and we are open to criticism. It's the unfairness of life and we will prevail. I think though that uh, the more that people like yourselves come and visit Israel and see for yourselves what the country is made of, how we live our lives, uh, realize that we are basically an okay people, uh, that we have many things in common with the people of Denmark, with the people of Europe in general, with the people of the world, uh, will help us. So I would like to uh, thank you, Pastor, for inviting me, first of all, to come here, but also for taking the initiative of bringing a group to Israel It's a journey that we take together. It's soul food from the heart. In God, we're united in our differences. It's a place of getting in touch with God, others, and your destiny. Come and visit ICC, the international Christian community, a church where great things come together.